right, let me uh, do the formal intro and then we will uh, get going from there. All right. Hey everyone, Anthony Fantano here, internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you are doing well. And today we are embarking on an exclusive conversation and interview uh, once again with the one and only Cole Bennett of Lyrical Lemonade fame, uh, videographer, tastemaker, and so much more. Uh, it's been a few years since we've had Cole on and um, he's accomplished quite a bit and underwent some uh, huge projects since the last time that we uh, had a convo with Cole. Um, recently, he and Lyrical Lemonade just put out this, uh, you know, huge all is yellow Lyrical Lemonade uh, compilation that features uh, many artists that he's worked with and featured over the years on the Lyrical Lemonade platform. Uh, hope to kind of get your thoughts on that and anything else that comes up in this conversation, dude. Thank you for coming through. How are you doing? Doing well, man. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of time has passed since we last spoke and um, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling excited and inspired right now. Okay. I mean, I, I think, um, one of the biggest questions or things that like kind of sticks out in my mind from our last conversation is, you know, you were really kind of reaching a place with your work and with lyrical lemonade where you weren't just like simply making great music videos that were, you know, uh, highly sought after, but you were also kind of using your platform to do a lot of taste making and sort of like mm -hmm. put on certain songs and artists, um, you know, through just kind of profiling them, uh, with your work and on your platform. And it seems like you've really embraced that role, you know, in a big way, especially now with this, uh, you know, new record that you've just come out with, because I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's not like you're just saying, Hey, here's a song that I like or here's an artist that I like, I'm going to, you know, feature them in a video, put them on the channel. You're literally like helping construct an album loaded with artists that, you know, you enjoy uh, their work or you enjoy working with, you know? So it's like, how do you feel like, you know, your, I guess, process has kind of changed as you've uh, embraced more that side of what you do and uh, sort of found more, I guess, space in what you do for, for that kind of focus? Yeah, I think I, I've kind of always had my hand lightly in a lot of the songs that, that I would do videos for. Mm. Like I said, very lightly, it would be just like small input here and there, like what's popping, you know, let's take this opening eight, throw it at the end of the song and create a hook because it was just a freestyle at first. And oh, okay. um, just putting little little notes in on music that um, that I that I was interested in doing a video for. Mm. So obviously, uh nowhere near as ambitious as putting together a full full album um but it was just a, it's, it's always been a fun thing to kind of be in studio sessions and have ideas and you know just world building in a way and i thought that the album would be a good way to try my hand at that while i have time you know i i feel like um it's 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 a like i said a very ambitious um project to go at but it was something that I wanted to challenge myself to do and really open the door for future uh, directors to be able to try new things. I think, you know, building the Lyric Lemonade platform on the YouTube channel kind of broke down some doors for, you know, just upcoming uh, directors or tastemakers, whatever it may be. And I feel like the album was um, opening that door a little bit further for, you know, people to just try new things and get out of their comfort zone. So that was really um, like the the motive behind doing it and kind of allowing myself to be able to put together songs that I knew wouldn't exist otherwise. And, you know, I worked with most of the artists on the album and had to have a really good relationship with most of them. And some of the artists I had never worked with but we had built a rapport over the years where, you know, we always talked, you know, someone like a Sway Lee or a Amine or an Umi, right? Um, all people that, um, you know, I would enjoy working with, but had just built different relationships with. So it was just a way for me to to just try something new. I think it's important to get out of your comfort zone. Hmm. Did you find in those initial conversations, was, was it kind of difficult to get maybe some people you were working with to kind of like see the vision of what you were doing, because you're not necessarily coming at this from the standpoint of like a producer or a songwriter mm -hmm. or something like that, you know, like, yeah. Um, or go ahead. You want to finish? Oh, no, no, that, that was, that was pretty oh. much it. I, I think, um, I, I think passion and integrity equates to, to trust in, in a lot of situations. And I think, you know, 
over my career, I think I've displayed both of those things um, consistently to all the people I work with. So when I mentioned doing a project, uh, everyone was on board. I didn't really have any difficulties in that regard. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a really collaborative effort. You know, I would pitch a concept and, you know, we'd kind of go back and forth and we'd build um, production from scratch with my buddies, Carlton, Danielle and uh, Marvy. And really, it was just it was just um, just throwing things at the wall and, and anything that felt exciting and compelling was something that I wanted to act on. And a lot of the album was thinking from a standpoint, um, thinking from the, the visual standpoint, you know, a lot of the decisions that were made and breaking some of the rules and structure and songs uh, were for the visual element of it. And, um, you know, cause I'm, I'm doing a video for every song and I'm, and I'm stitching them all together at the end where it's a full visual album, where there's transitions, there's actually a different, um, visual track list than there is on DSPs. And there's, you know, there's different, tr- um, transitions and different, um, moments of production and hidden features and stuff like that. And, uh, it was really just to kind of try things in my own way and and you know i was working with a lot of people who their expertise is music right and you know they're like ah do you really want to put a pre-chorus here is this outro make sense here and i loved the idea of just saying yeah why not you know and 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 breaking those rules um from time to time because it just felt freeing and it felt like who do we have to listen to what's it really matter you know and it was exciting so yeah man was was the vision always a project or did it sort of like start with like a trickle of songs and stuff like that? Um, yeah, the vision, well, I, well, I kind of had always like played around with the idea of doing a, an album, a lyrical nominated album since like 2018. Mm-hmm. There's just always so much, you know, there's been so much going on for so many years. And I feel like I finally gotten to a point where I've really established myself and, and could have a moment where I could like take some time to, to approach this properly in a way where I could be proud of what it feels like in 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know that there wouldn't be a song like hummingbird on the album if I did, you know, this in 2018, you know, and, uh, you know, I, you know, love, love a, a, a lot of the people that I've worked with, but I just don't know, if I would have created something then, if I would have been able to be proud of it the same way, I think I'll be able to be proud of this one. Um, just like, you know, how I've been able to develop as an artist and how I, th- I, I, you know, like to conceptualize like, you know, world building and things of that nature. I just don't know if I would have been able to do it then, nor did I have the time um, or patience then. And I think I just needed to mature a little bit and my taste needed to mature a little bit. And I really just, you know, made this, for for me and for you know those kids that want to try something new and i think a lot more of this um this this album is going to make sense when people see it stitched together visually um because that was really where my head was at while creating it you know a lot of the songs were created for that moment Hmm. was there anything in your mind as you were kind of conceptualizing thing that uh, conceptualizing this thing that um felt almost like a rubric that you could work off of or something like that. I mean, in a way, and obviously, you know, I, I see what you're doing with this record as, you know, being uh, more interesting than this by comparison. But like, you know, I, I think of maybe other artists that take more like a curator role on their records, like DJ Khaled, or, you know, maybe um, this could be compared in a sense to like a label compilation, like, you know, how Dream Bill you know, has a mm-hmm. whole record where, you know, all their best and brightest kind of come into the fold. Were there any albums like that in mind when, you know, you were kind of putting this together? Or did it feel like something entirely different for you? No, definitely. I think the Dreamville project is a great example. Uh, the cozy tape stuff, mm-hmm. you know, all that ASAP stuff, mm-hmm. just stuff that feels like people coming together and making music and not trying to, you know, that there was never a point where we're like, yeah, we're trying to make a hit record with this, you know? And um, I'm a big fan of what DJ Khaled does, but I just think, you know, he's, he, the, the, there's different approaches that different people take. And right, right. Um, yeah, there's I definitely think a more, certain sonic world to DJ Khaled's, work right and there's definitely a different one to yours too yeah and that's great right and i think the great thing about a dj Khaled album the, the most cohesive thing about a dj Khaled album rather is his his um 
his his vocal touches all over every song you know you know that that it's that it's a dj cowed album right. um that was something obviously that i didn't do um nor did i have interest in doing so i wanted to make it feel cohesive still because you're right um say a grace and hummingbird sound like they don't belong on the same project um so through the wardrobe of the videos and everyone in this formal attire you know these suits with the yellow tie and this yellow curtain that is where the theme and the cohesion comes together. So that's what that's one of the areas where I, you know, I speak to it as being more of a visual album than anything because a lot of these themes are tied in visually um, more than from, you know, uh, like sonically from from a standpoint of sonics. It's more of um, a visual approach, and uh, there's definitely songs that complement each other, or you know, I, I kind of like consider. Um, in the same batch of things on the album. Um, I think, you know, Equilibrium and Guitar in My Room, it kind of has that guitar and it's like, it, there, there's a lot of similar themes there, but for the most part, it's a lot of different worlds and there's a lot of jumping around, which I, I love. And sometimes even on one song, you get that, you know, with First Night on the piano and Tito's intro right into the, you know, the uh, Juicy J drums and, and chorus. So. Yeah, I think it's a it's a visually cohesive album. That was my intention, and me being a director, um, that's what I want to come through. Mm. So, like these different sections were almost kind of feeling like different scenes for you, you know, mm -hmm. as they kind of jump from part to part. Because you know, to your point, um, you know, more than cohesion, I feel like one of the most consistent things about this record is the contrast. Mm -hmm. You know, because it, you're you're bringing such, at least in the minds of most people such varied and such vastly different worlds together, not just across the record, but on a single song, you know, mm -hmm. was there any sort of like, I don't know, uh, uh, difficulties to overcome or, you know, issues run into in the process of being like, we need to somehow make Gus Dapperton and Lil Yachty work in the same, right. you know, couple of minutes, you know what I mean? Because, because again, you know, these are like artists who maybe some people from the outside would see more as like oil and water, you know, just like not mm -hmm. even existing on the same plane. Yeah, no, I think a lot of people from the outside looking in would feel that way, but there's a lot of appreciation um, for for different pockets of different genres um, more than I think people would realize. You know, so take Fallout, for example. Um, Gus is a, grew up being a huge fan of Joey Badass, loves Lil Yachty, so it worked. Yachty doesn't know who Gus Dapperton is, right? But he... Yeah really enjoyed and loved the song and we've seen him you know dabble with the alternative sound already so it like it it was there's an appreciation and i think the appreciation allows people to feel comfortable working together and to me that's all i can hear right? you can hear me mm -hmm. yeah i can hear you. to me that's all i can hear is you know how it was made and people coming together and the excitement on both ends so when i hear something after we complete it I'm not listening from an outside perspective as much as I am just being in the heart and soul of, of this project of like, you know, everyone really what it feels like to me putting their best foot forward and, and trying new things. So, and, and there's a lot of, you know, twists and turns, like the original version of, um, of, uh, fallout has Dave on it instead of, instead of Yachty right there. Oh, okay. And, um, and then last minute I, I wanted him to, to cut something to the to the jack song instead but there's just uh there's so many stories behind every song um that to me allow me to really love the songs and i understand that you know from the outside perspective you know there's only so much context right so right. uh it, it's it's a different point of view but you know i, I that's why i really was saying like this is this is kind of just something for me and obviously you want people to enjoy it don't get me wrong but you know a lot of the um negative response uh to me doesn't doesn't really bo bother me too much obviously you don't love to see it but I, I i do enjoy seeing a dialogue being created and you know even your review on the album um i really appreciate that i even sent you a message i i, I enjoyed it because it was it was true and it was honest and and you know the constructive elements of it were received and then 
the light moments of praise were also received and, and appreciated. So it's just good to put something like, like this out there. It's like a lot of people are scared to do something like this because it could be, you know, it could be perceived in different ways. And I kind of went into this knowing that it would, I mean, I don't expect everyone to, to love this. And I think that it's allowed me to, um, I don't know, just be better and be excited and be able to, um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm excited. I don't even know what the question was or how I, how I landed on this. <laughs> well, but. you know, to, to your point earlier about like, the stories behind some of these tracks. I mean, I, I do have to ask because I do have specific questions about some of these songs. I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of people do. I mean, you know, for one, maybe the most obvious is like, you know, how, how did Doomsday come together? And like, how long were you like sitting on that track or that juice verse or, you know, whatever, like what was the assembly or the plan for that? Um, you know, just, just kind of take us through it considering like how immense of a crossover and how, um, successful of a moment that was for the album as far as a single as far as just like you know song quality as far as also just like the music video as well like just yeah. pure insanity from beginning to end thank you so much yeah the two songs that were existing on the album prior to really putting together the album just songs i've had in my notes for years um was doomsday and with the fish um both of these songs um have uh artists on it that are no longer here with us who um i had had built a, a great relationship with and obviously you know a a lyrical lemonade album um calls for having a lot of the the artists that are a big part of this story mm -hmm. and doing something like this without juice um just wouldn't feel right but then also kind of like putting together some posthumous song and like gathering features and like switching production also wouldn't fe feel right you know right. so this was a song that fit the theme of the album perfectly in the sense of um it's two artists who had never worked together before mm -hmm. um it's a song that already existed there was no you know um construction of the song after the fact it was a song that juice really loved um when juice made this song he called me the next day and was just super super thrilled about it and i he he was making so much music that that excitement would always come through but it was you'd never know which which song he liked more than the next because he would just start making another song and then it would be the, the next song he was excited about and this was a song that I think he really enjoyed because it's an old Eminem beat. He's rapping and, and Corday is also a, was also a really, really close friend of juices. Right. Um, and you know, the fact that none of, you know, cause they had made a couple of songs, the fact that none of it ever got to see the light, um, was, was unfortunate, you know, and this was, uh, um, a song that, that just felt, it felt right. It felt true to the story. Corday's a really close friend of mine. Juice was a really close friend of mine. Corday and Juice were great friends. So yeah, it just felt like the appropriate um, kickoff to the album. Cause there was another song that um, I was, I was in the studio with, uh, with Juice years ago, five, six years ago. And um, it was really beautiful, but it was just, it was just him. And it was also a song that had been leaked many times and, um, you know, just toyed with in a lot of different ways. And um, Doomsday felt right, like I said, because it was a collaboration element, which is a theme on the album. And then also it was no one had ever heard it. You know, I think it ended up leaking like three days before the song came out because people caught wind of the fact that it was coming out. So the juice uh, hackers leaked it. But yeah, it just it just felt right. It just felt it just felt right. And it was something Juice was really, really excited about. So that made me feel comfortable. Hmm. When did the Eminem beat come into play with the whole thing? The you talking about on the Eminem song? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you know, obviously, um, like most artists, especially artists at their level, when they're looking to like you know release or record original music, like you know your go to isn't like oh yeah, let's grab a you know a beat off like this old Slim Shady album. You know what I mean? Like uh -huh. you know, uh, again, I'm just saying like kind of interesting choice. Like, do you have any sort of like info on what exactly kind of drove oh. that decision? You're talking about the original Doomsday? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, the oh, original, yeah. Do the original. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
that that's uh actually juice's um one of juice's favorite eminem songs he oh, actually okay. freestyled on that beat on um one of those like hour-long eminem um but that was actually a song he would an instrumental he would he would often freestyle on it and it was just one of his favorites um and one of one of corday's favorites as well hmm. it's an iconic iconic uh eminem beat right there it's dr dre produced too so it's just like it's uh it's a special one. Well, I mean, since we just kind of gave it a nod, um, you know, do you have anything to say about, uh, you know, obviously the part two version of the song where you bring Eminem on and, um, you know, I mean, it's obviously, a you know, a cool and interesting inclusion for the record and kind of adds to the progression and I guess the story of the album, but simultaneously, uh, <clears throat> also the track kind of popped off in its own right because it's just a huge benzino diss right <laughs> you know did you feel like uh i don't know maybe that sort of like what, what, what do you feel like that kind of brought to the narrative of the record given uh you know eminem just sort of said what he had to say on it yeah i i think um I, like i said a lot of the songs in the album were really collaborative mm -hmm. and you know we got to build out concepts and um a lot of really great in-studio sessions and moments and reworking things and um mm -hmm. Doomsday Part Two came about. Um, we 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 flipped the original, the original beat, and uh, I sent it to him long, long time ago. Hmm. And uh, and then I, I I didn't know if he was ever going to do anything on it or not. And then um, as the the album was approaching and we we're getting ready to turn things in, um, it came in, and uh, we were actually working on a few other songs for the album um some that didn't end up landing on the album that 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 um i'm really excited about but uh but yeah i i kind of like i said i didn't know what to expect it, it wasn't uh like a collaborative thing as much as the other songs where it was kind of you know here's the flip of this song it's the continuation of the original doomsday which is a flip of his old song to begin with role model and um I, I I I really enjoyed uh, some of the delivery and, and and how it came. The the Benzino thing to me, uh, it is just kind of like something that I that I heard the same way that everyone else did. It just kind of it just you know it was it was what he had sent in, and what he has going on in that department um, has has uh, obviously nothing to do with me. But you know, I think. Uh, it created a dialogue and they have their own history and that's where he was at when he made the song. And I think that's what makes it special in its own way is that's just what he was feeling that day when he, when he, you know, approached that song is Benzino was on his mind, I guess. But yeah, I think, you know, getting to work with M is, is one of the, the highest honors and, and to have him a part of this project and just look at that track list and seeing him on there is, is nothing short of a childhood dream. So, um, I'm just thankful he could be a part of it, man. Uh, you know, what were some of the feelings that were, I guess, kind of like feeling the intro of the album, because, you know, that that's especially one of the kind of the, the biggest and most explosive songs on the album and, and production wise, maybe has like the most movie trailer type beat on the entire mm -hmm. record. I mean, you know, did, did, did starting this whole thing off feel kind of like a movie for you or like a film narrative in a way? Yeah. I, I think that, well, well, that song in particular was inspired. I was watching a, a, a movie scene and it was the end of the wild and hmm. he was approaching this mountain and there's this Eddie Vedder song that was playing and there's this really crazy buildup and it felt suspenseful and, and, and cinematic. And I was like, we have to create a song like this that takes us into the album. And I was like, during the buildup, I want Sheck West shout and shit. And, you know, I want to be also beautiful at the same time. And then I want, you know, the, 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 the drums to come in and, and ski kick it off. But, um, that was really a song that beginning to finish was just super, super, um, I don't know, visual for me. I, I think that I kind of saw that one from the beginning, as a piece that needed to exist as the intro. Um, but yeah, I, I, like I said, the, the album is for more so from, from my point of view, obviously everyone could take it and interpret it their own ways and make it their own. But for me, it's more um, visual. So, so that song I think does a great job of, of encapsulating that. 
And uh, yeah, I, I did kind of approach this as, you know, this is like a movie to me. And this is, you know, because it's, you got to keep in mind, I'm doing music videos that ranges from at max, I'm working on something for a month and a half at the absolute max a lot of time a lot of times a lot shorter than that sometimes it's just a few days I've, I've shot many videos where the you know we shot it and it came out four days later um so i knew that this taking on this would allow me to eventually prepare for just longer format projects you know a movie one day or you know and as i get older i think i need to kind of unlearn some things of this really fast work pace i want to learn how to be more patient and you know eventually be able to yeah take on a movie and do something like that and this album kind of acted as a a bridge into that in a way what about also let's say like you know your recent work on that jack black crossover for the mario movie like you know how long did that shoot take and did sort of being so close in proximity directly to you know the film industry in that in that sense with it being a part of like this huge film rollout you know did that give you any sort of like reflection on what you're doing, what you could be doing, and sort of like what the ceiling is for this and Lyrical Lemonade. Absolutely, man. Well, the Peaches video with Jack Black, we shot that in literally an hour and a half. No um, fucking, <laughs> no fucking yeah, way. No, but it was really, really, really quick. But that's, but Jack Black is also an absolute natural and he's so impressive in so many different ways. And when you get him in front of a camera, he's just, He's literally electric. And that's the difference of when you're working with a rapper versus when you're working with a professional actor. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you have to keep in mind with with music, you know, musician, the, the video element of it to allow it's just a counterpart. So a lot of them are, aren't, aren't taking it as serious. You know, Trippy Red is smoking backwoods all day in his green room and he comes out four hours late. You know, Jack Black gets there and he's ready to go. And it's just it's a different world. And you can't blame any of the artists for for not being that way is just like this is this is just a different a different league of well, its yeah, none, own. None, none of them got into the industry for video production yeah, yeah. And some people are great in that regard i've never sure. worked with a top creator but i can only imagine how brilliant he is on set mm -hmm. you know and um it, i will say that doing uh rap music videos for 10 years now has definitely um uh, uh, it's given me a lot of um, perspective and experience to to be able to work with people who might not be as excited, you know, and I think that that's given me, I don't know, I think it's helped me in a lot of ways. And, you know, uh, yeah, so I think working closely to, and I, I can't say I've worked closely with the, the film community at all, but, you know, I've been a part of the Minions uh, movie roll out and then obviously again with the, the Mario movie, but it just... It's just a different pace, but everyone kind of appreciates it's weird because, you know, from that perspective, they want what the music industry has to offer and the music industry wants what the film industry has to offer. And it's like everyone's kind of just looking out the window at the next thing. And it's like we're all we all I don't know. It's an interesting thing. But, yeah, I don't I don't know. It's uh, it's. Well, I mean, you know, hour and a half shoot with Jack Black on set. W what about, you know, set design and everything? Because that was like a pretty immaculate, you mm -hmm. know, at apparatus that you, <laughs> that you were shooting around for that whole thing. Yeah. So the idea was when you approach something like that, um, keep in mind, we had shot this before the movie had come out. So we didn't, you know, I, when I watched the movie, because kind of what happens with Illumination, they'll bring me in to watch these movies early and they'll kind of get my idea on what I think would be a cool way to to be creative with with you know a, a marketing piece or whatever it may be and when i watched that that song had stood out to me and you know obviously with the minions movie i'd done the the trailer with the eat song that we had built out and i was like for this it would be really cool to get jack black as you know himself right. in a in, in a bowser suit and and perform this song and it just ended up being a really standout song in the movie. So that that worked in our favor. But I wanted to create a world where he could just operate. And the set was really, really amazing. Uh, shouts out to my brother, uh, Cody Fusina, who, who, who built that. But I wanted just this, like, this, this desaturated pink room that felt futuristic, yet nostalgic in its own way. And something that was very um 
just minimalistic with the piano, the steps, you know, the, the circle windows and where you could kind of get a peek of the Mario universe outside of it. But it still felt you had that aspect of realism with Jack Black. in there. But it was really just like, let's create a really beautiful set, capture it from a lot of, you know, great frames and, and good composition and just let Jack Black be Jack Black. And that's kind of how it how it happened. You know, kind of going a bit meta from here, how do you feel like, okay, I'll, I'll say this. I feel like so much has happened with you in terms of like projects, accomplishments, stuff that you've gotten out there since we last talked. Mm -hmm. And in terms of like vibe, focus, vision, you seem absolutely positively like the same, totally like mm -hmm. almost unchanged in terms of like you have a focus on what you want to do. You want to grow Lyrical Lemonade, you want to branch it out, you're focused on the art. Like, there's so much attention on you and what you do. Like, how are you able to, as things grow and get bigger, probably bigger beyond, you know, your even own comprehension or, you know, your ability to do everything yourself, how are you still able to sort of like maintain just a focus on the art and just sort of stay within the confines of your craft? As, because, I mean, a lot of people sort of like lose sight of that as things kind of get bigger and more attention is drawn toward them. Yeah, I think what I've realized, I think you just kind of got to keep taking inventory of how you're feeling and you have to be aware of what excites you and what doesn't. And I think that, you know, there's really big moments that happen for Lyrical Lemonade and, you know, things that have, have been presented that would really be exciting from a different, like, viewpoint. But for me, it it it, it doesn't sound very exciting. And, I, and I, I realize that what makes me most happy is just kind of creating things that I want to create. And it's not about money or building it into this huge empire. It's just about doing things that I love. And if that comes with it, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shy away from something that, that could, could, ha could help me live more comfortably and my family live more comfortably. But if it doesn't align with, you know, like my creative integrity, then I'll just pass on it. Cause um, I love being excited. I love being passionate. And I also understand that it's very easy to lose those feelings if you start doing things that doesn't fill that side of you up. And um, even with the album, it's been challenging in a way because, um, you know, you have one day where you're really excited about this idea and then, you know, you, you get outside input that suggests something else or whatever it may be. And you have to kind of learn what you want to welcome in and what you don't want to welcome in. And I think it's just about, I don't know, figuring out what that that viewpoint is. Like I said, when I watched the review that you gave of the album, I was literally ecstatic. I was so excited. You gave it a five, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I've been watching your stuff for years. Sure. And um, I understand your viewpoint. I understand how you break things down. I understand your art and it's true to you. You know what I mean? And people might hate you. People might love you, but they have to respect you because you're just giving your opinion, right? You're doing what you want to do. If you wanted to, you know, capture the younger generation, then you would just give, you know, every Destroy Lonely and Ken Carson project a 10 out of 10. And, you know, they love you. Right. But you have your vision and you follow what you do. And that's what keeps you happy. So for me, that's what I want to do with my art, with how I carry myself forward is I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's going to keep me happy. So. Yeah, just trying not to conform to, you know, what, what people expect of you or whatever it may be. And I think that's like the goal to maintaining that creative integrity. Um, where, where do you feel like you're, I feel like maybe you answered this in a sense, but I want to kind of drill down to this a bit, like as your projects are kind of like, you know, going into different fields and you're attempting different things and, you know, you're taking on different tasks. How do you feel like the original, I guess, makeup or mission of Lyrical Lemonade is currently? Is that still maintained? Is that still going forward? And what I mean by that is, you know, do you still feel like you're kind of focused on this idea of, of music celebration, music curation, putting on artists who you're interested in and care about, you know, I, I think about something like, for example, the effect that you've had long-term with something like the what's poppin video, you know, I mean, that's an artist that 
I mean, sure, Jack Harlow has been around for years and was grinding for quite a while before he worked with you. And, uh, you know, you can't say that the man's success uh, isn't also due to his own effort, but, you know, obviously the What's Poppin' video, you know, helped quite a bit and sort of put him on in a way that uh, maybe you wouldn't have had the opportunity to without it. And I guess what I'm getting at is uh, now seeing him, you know, topping the charts multiple times, you know, because th that dude's just like cranking out number ones. Um, you know, do you see that and think like, man, wouldn't it be cool to be a part of like such a thing again? You know, do you feel like you're active kind of like you're actively seeking out the next kind of like artists who will have that kind of impact down the road? Or do you think like, you know, um, your passion or your drive or your focus is on other things and accomplish right, accomplishments right now, potential accomplishments with, you know, videography and lyrical lemonade and this record and whatever else you want to do. I think it's so funny um, because that was never really the goal. The goal mm. was never to break artists, right? Mm. Like that just kind of started happening and took a life of its own time and time after again. And time and time again, and, and to the point where people started to think that that was like the mission, right? Mm -hmm. That was like what we, you know, and I think a lot of people began to identify Lyric Lemonade as that. And I wasn't mad at it. Obviously, it was great, you know, to, to create a platform that could help launch an artist and help his career. Who wouldn't want that? It's it's amazing. But then again, that wasn't the sole point of the company. It was to, for, for me to do music videos for songs that I was into, and it just so happened to be that that's where my head was at at that time. Mm -hmm. But we have to also understand that, you know, I'm growing older now. I'm 27. I'll be 28 this year. Oh, you're, and, an, you're uh, an old man. You're, you're, I know. You're old as fucking dirt. I know. I'm getting get, up there. Get out of the music industry. What are you doing? Right. <laughs> but, uh, but so for me, I just want to do things that I'm into. And if that happens to be this young artist that, that, that it then catapults his career, then, then so be it. Um, but I, I, I think, um, I think it was just a different time too. I think music in the industry, and I've gotten kind of a closer look at it through doing this project. It's all a lot more controlled than we think. And I think now more than ever, it's that way. And if you look at the past two years, there's been hardly any artists who have really broke out. Mm -hmm. And when I say broke out, I'm not talking about like, you know, Xavier uh, so based in that spend I, I'm talking about like the Ice Spice and the Yeats of like really taking it to a mainstream level right it's, it's it, it doesn't happen too often I think right now we're kind of seeing four bats be that in a way but it, it just doesn't happen where it's like six years ago you it was it was it was 15 plus artists like honestly a year yeah. you know and no I I, I, I don't disagree I, I think I think without people realizing because <clears throat> none of this is like spelled out explicitly is mm -hmm. the, the algorithms have gotten so much more insane in terms mm -hmm. of like just really drilling directly into what is already popular and what is known to already is, is most likely going to be popular. And like yeah. those weird variants that actually kind of present something new or something different um, or, you know, hit people with something up and coming, just, it's, it's just not happening as much as it used to. You know, it's like, I don't know if like today you could have a Tyler, the creator Yonkers type moment, you know, yeah. over, and, and over I, again. There also used to, and I don't want to be like, there used to be this, there used to be that, but now all of the music industry is controlled by like the blogs and everyone is controlled by the labels. So like, obviously I came up in a time where it was internet blogs, like Big Shore Drive, Ill Roots, like Lyric Lemonade started as me writing articles on the Lyric Lemonade website because I was passionate about showing Chicago underground talent that wasn't getting covered, right, to the mm -hmm. Chicago community, where it's like now you don't see a single post. Um, sorry, there's a, something getting cut outside of my window. Oh. Now you don't see a, a single um, Instagram post by these blogs that aren't, paid by these labels and such and it's an interesting place because now it, it, it's like if an artist is too small and they get a blog placement then the audience the audience is so smart now that they understand that they're like oh like you paid for ogm promo or whatever right you right, know right. And it's like so it actually hurts them and yeah, it, like it, it creates growing, kind of a cynicism where anybody yeah, th growing, where or, anybody sees something out of the ordinary they think it's a plant or they think it's being forced down their throats or they're kind of skeptical of it Exactly. And growing organically is like such a, just a rare thing. And, um, because all these blogs, they just, all these labels just have 
the blogs on retainers from month to month or quarterly. Mm-hmm. And it, these, these blogs are, are meeting their, you know, their requirement of, man, do you hear that? No, no, no. You're good. You're good. You're good. Oh, you can't, yeah, just, keep, just keep going on. Um, the, the, these, these blogs are meeting their requirement of, oh, I have to do 15, um, Interscope post this month, mm. you know, and they'll post about whoever to fulfill this requirement that then allows them to get their retainer. And it's like, bro, that's what I'm talking about is like, it's so controlled now where it's like lyrical lemonade. I, I never, ever, a- every blog post I ever wrote that we ever put out, we never got paid for that. And if I ever found out that, uh, I'm sorry, damn, hold on. <laughs> You can't hear that? No, no, you're good. Okay. You, you, must, you just must have a very directional mic on this thing. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, okay, only, okay. I'm only hearing you. Okay. Um, every blog post that I ever wrote or that we ever put out, we ever published on the website was because we wanted to. And every time I found out that a writer was getting paid because that happened a couple of times, we cut them off. Mm. That was so against what we were building because it was supposed to be organic and pushing stuff that we were actually into. Mm. And if someone has a homie there that they want to highlight here and there, that's cool. You know what I mean? But it, it, it's just like, it's not, it's, it's, it, we're seeing a lot of things happening and it. it's just like, it's painful for me to see. Cause it's like, even when I did the, the BOP kosher video a year ago, I did that for free. I, I, I literally, I paid for that video. Mm. I didn't get a dollar from it. I, I, there's something I wanted to do. I was like, I met him. I thought he was great. I think he's incredible. Let's do it. And I'm not saying that I don't get paid for videos that I, that I do videos for free all the time. I get yeah. paid for my services. Right. Right. Um, but I don't know. I think that a lot of things are, are controlled by money right now. And I think that the labels have a lot more control than they've ever had. And it's allowed, it, it's, it's making less room for young artists to grow up or to, to, to um, blow up and, and find moments um, authentically. Um, and, and I don't know. So, so we're just living in, when, we're living in interesting times right now. Um, and I don't ever want to chase that feeling of, you know, we're going to blow up this artist or do this or do that. It's just, if it happens, it happens, but that's not the motive for what we do. Um, I will say that as I, um, as I continue to explore new mediums and try new things, I will be signing on new directors to Lyric Lemonade and I will be mentoring them. Um, and yeah, I, I do see uh, an opportunity for, for us to highlight younger artists more than I, I think that I've been doing the last couple of years. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of that is just uh where I'm at my career, my taste, and, and a lot of the friendships I've built. You know, I think a lot of the people I work with are people that I've created relationships and friendships with over the years. So um, it's kind of what I naturally favor towards, you know. That kind of brings me to one of my last questions here. I mean, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about, you know, the visual aspects of what you do, because obviously that's major and that's important. Um, you know, you've been making these videos, you've been making rap videos for a decade now. And, uh, you know, you kind of sit in this interesting place where Lyrical Lemonade has a very kind of like defined and recognizable visual style Mm -hmm. with a lot of the projects that you put out. But simultaneously, like there's no kind of, you know, unanimous opinion that anything that you're doing visually has become stale, you know, and Mm -hmm. you're coming out with so much work and doing so many projects and working with so many different artists. Like, how do you prevent yourself from kind of painting yourself in a corner you know, taking on so much and not just like kind of repeating a lot of the same ideas over and over and over, just like for the sake of saving time and maybe like mental bandwidth, you know, are you Mm -hmm. kind of taking inspiration from a lot of other directors, movies, music videos? Like, how are you kind of keeping things fresh and challenging yourself creatively? Well, I think I learned a lesson when I was young, like a few years ago, probably six years ago or so when, you know, Lyric Lemonade's in its you know, whatever you want to call it, the glory days of just like pumping out stuff and people blowing up and all this. And I actually was seeing a lot of um, comments saying, you know, it's starting to look the same. It's starting to do this. And the, the, the reality to that was is that it was my Sony A7S III camera with my three lenses. And I would repeat the same shots over and over and over again. <laughs> uh-huh. So, you know, I, I, I was like, I need to reinvest into more equipment and kind of start to 
you know, see other perspectives on how I could be shooting things. And, um, and I think I've, I've been so blessed to, to, to have creative freedom now where it's like, I want to try and bring different things to life and, and never get too comfortable because when I do get comfortable and I do see this every now and then I'll see three videos that come out in a row that I've done that have similarities. And I'll be like, okay, I need to snap out of this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just like, okay, I'm favoring one lens too much, or I really love this color palette. And I think the funny thing about the album, right, is I'm putting out these videos and the, the YouTube audience, the, the, our subscriber base on there versus, you know, what the socials have, it, the YouTube is a much larger audience. And I understand that they're not tapped into everything I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So they, a lot of these people that are seeing the videos coming out don't even know that there's an album or that these songs are a part of one project. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing someone comment on the, the G Herbo Babytron video and like, oh, you just reused the Chief Keef set. How lazy. Or, oh, you use the same curtain like from here. Why are you cop? Why did... Corbin, Tracy, and Black Cray copy Corday and Juice. You know, it's like people that really don't understand it. So I went into this project knowing that I'm putting out all these videos that have a very similar style and color palette to them. Right. That some people might confuse it for, you know, my style getting stale or me doing this or me doing that. But I always am able to zoom out and look at what it looks like in five years from now as a moment in time and people being able to appreciate it with time. It's like, even when I did the iPhone series, I got a lot of hate on that. The first one was cool. The second one was cool. The third one, it's like, oh, he's another one. The fourth one, it's like, oh no, come on now. The fifth one, they're like, we fucking hate this guy. Hmm. But what I will say is in five years from now, people will look back at that and appreciate it because it did inspire some young kid who only had his phone to, to go start shooting something. And, and a lot of those videos I edited on the phone too. And I would put the apps, the free apps at the end of the video that I would use. So I was really just trying to help and push something forward. And no, I didn't partner with Apple. At first I explored the idea of that could be cool. And then as time went on and by the time they reached out, I was like, it just, it, it felt too forced. But sometimes things take time to be appreciated. And um, that's how I look at a lot of these moments and, and moments in time and the album being one of them. Um, just uh, whether you appreciate the music or not, I think we'll be able to appreciate the moment. Whether you appreciate it now, I think people will be able to see the beauty in it eventually. And um, we see that with a lot of, uh, a lot of art. Uh, think about yeah. so many movies. Think about, think about Belly, right? Hmm. I iconic film within the hip hop space. Hype Williams' first feature, I, be, I believe his only feature, um, and it was like a box office fail and like, you know, the the critiques by, you know, all of the the Hollywood media, whatever it may be. And now it's looked at as a cult classic, you know, and, and people were mad that he shot it in like a music video and it's lit this certain way and they're using fisheye lenses here to tell this narrative story here and then... As time goes on, you're like, wait, I love this for this because it's its own thing and it aged well. And, you know, sometimes you got to zoom out. Hmm. Uh, before you go, you know, without, I guess, spoiling anything huge that you're trying to keep under wraps, um, you know, what do you have coming down the pipe that people can look forward to, you know? Um, getting all these videos out off the album individually, one by one, and then the full visual album that ties it all together is one piece. Um and then I'm, I'm going to relax for a little bit. Um, I have a few videos I'm, I'm planning on doing right now. That a, I'm working a, a break on. is valid. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm going I'm I'm to take a break. I'm going to spend some time with my family and, you know, relax. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, just a lot of stuff. Um, we have our, our, our lemonade that goes into 7-Eleven in March, which is really exciting. It'll be on Amazon. So it's um, literally a lemonade now. Yeah. 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 So yeah. now people will just be like, what the fuck is this music? I thought this was, I thought this was just a lemonade thing. Exactly. But that's yeah. the beauty of lemonade. It's like a lot of people in Chicago only know it as a music festival, right? Mm -hmm. Not, not, not a lot of people, but there's definitely people that hear lyrical lemonade and they think the festival, mm -hmm. you know, that's a very real thing. There's a lot of people that hear it and think music videos. And eventually there's going to be people that only know it as a lemonade. That's mm -hmm. the fun of it all, you know? All right, man. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I know, I know a lot of my audience just know you as that guy who I've interviewed two times, you know, yeah. like, who, who is this guy? He looks great. You know, seems like a nice dude. Love when he pops yeah. up on the channel. 
<laughs> I appreciate you, man. Thank you, Anthony. All right. Thank you so much, man. Have a good rest of your day.